Okay, in this lecture, we're going to do a once over the world look at the different kinds of people and jobs that are running the modern healthcare system. So there we go. If I get my screen to flip. Okay. So broadly, we're going to talk about these categories of health services professions. So we'll talk about physicians. We'll talk about these non-physician mid-level providers, nurses, of course, because that's huge, and some others. So first, let's start with physicians. Broadly speaking, we have a relatively narrow group of people who are, are called physicians. They have, some of them have different degrees. So the most common um, person who is referred to as a physician in the United States is, is an MD or medical doctor. Um, you are also going to be exposed likely, and you might have without even knowing it, having have been cared for by a doctor of osteopathy. That's a DO. Um, so if you go to see a physician and you look at their credentials, most likely you're either going to see MD or DO. Um, the difference between MD and DO is primarily historical. It was a, a different approach to medicine. DOs had a more holistic perspective and modern physical therapy really grows out of the osteopathic tradition. They did quite a bit of manipulation of the spine um, as part of their normal practice. Today, you know, so my younger sister is a DO. She learned a little bit of manipulation, but as a family medicine doctor, she does not really use it. Some DOs still embrace it, but for the most part, there's very little difference in the training that DOs and MDs get maybe a little bit of a cultural attitudinal perspective, a little more holistic on the DO side. But that doesn't mean that MDs don't have holistic perspectives as well. It's just a, a little more of a cultural leaning in the way that they train. Also known as physicians are podiatrists. Um, so this is a doctor of podiatric medicine or a DPM. They go through their first two years of, of uh, podiatric training is all, is basically identical to what an MD or a DO would do. Um, they then focus on care of the patient basically below the knee. And then a naturopathic doctor or ND uh, has a long um, history in the United States coming out of the homeopathic tradition. Your book has a little more on that. I have an interview with one of the first naturopathic doctors in New Hampshire. So when you come to your assignment uh, to listen to a one of my interviews, um, you can, if you're interested, you can look for her. Okay, so physician training. This is a, they go through a lot of training. So first, in order to go to medical school in the United States, that's a graduate program. So you have to earn an, a BA or a BS, so a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science, doesn't really matter what you get it in. You can get a, a bachelor degree, bachelor's degree in English or philosophy, as long as you take the required pre-medical coursework, which includes um, dream killers like organic chemistry and physics. So physicians will graduate with a which with a bachelor's degree, they then go to medical school. Medical school is four years. The first two years are basically classroom didactic in most programs, not all, but in most programs, followed by two years of primarily clinical rotations where they get to get exposed to all the different fields of medicine that we'll be talking about here in just a second. After they finish medical school, they are legally doctors. They have to complete what's known as an internship, which is typically uh, is one year and is typically done as part of the residency process today. Technically, that allows them to go into practice. Almost no one does that anymore, in most part because no hospital would allow you to practice there without being residency qualified. So the vast majority of physicians do their BA four years, medical school four years, and then they go on to do a residency, which is where they start to specialize in a particular kind of, of medical practice. Residencies last anywhere from three to seven years 
and I have a list of them for you to look at. Some, some programs, some types of physicians have to do not only a residency, but a fellowship. And we'll talk about that in a minute, followed by they, they, after they complete their residency and or fellowship, they have to take boards to become board certified. So you'll hear someone referred to as a board certified orthopedic surgeon or a board certified obstetrics and gynecology physician. So let's talk about the different kinds of specialties. And there's a, there are some various ways to categorize physicians and none of them are perfect, but broadly medical and surgical are have the longest history in the way that we think about the way physicians are organized. So physicians once upon a time used to strictly be medical and surgical was done by, as I mentioned in previous lectures, done primarily by barbers, uh, and other non-physician types. And so physicians thought of themselves as kind of above doing surgery. Now this attitude changes greatly when we get into the 1850s and we have anesthesia and surgery can be more than just a barbaric last resort intervention and can become much more articulate, much more uh, precise and just creates a whole new avenue of medicine. Uh, psychiatry is sort of a separate and very recent discipline coming out of the out of the early 20th century and in particular really the mid century when we had drugs that actually began to work to treat mental health conditions and then the last category I'm going to call hospital based which are physicians that primarily do their work in a hospital setting in order to support other physicians, typically. So we'll come back to all of those. All right, so let's talk about the kind of medical uh, specialties. So I'm, I'm lumping in here primary care and the different kinds of primary care doctors include family medicine, pediatrics, and if you skip down here, internal medicine, which is adult medicine. So the difference between family medicine and internal medicine is family medicine, uh, takes you cradle to grave. So fam family medicine doctors, so my sister I mentioned is a family medicine doctor, learns, learned how to deliver babies as part of her residency. Uh, and then they treat the, the, the individual from birth through, uh, through um, developing their families to uh, old age and ultimately death. So family medicine tries to treat the patient along the whole lifespan, whereas internal medicine only does adults. So if you're an internal medicine doc, you know something about taking care of children, but you really only treat adult patients. Pediatrics, on the other hand, really only treats pediatric patients. So zero to technically, um, some pediatricians will see you into your 20s. The human brain in particular, the male human brain continues to develop through the mid twenties. So uh, pediatrics and you ha can have a sub specialty of adolescent medicine um, deals strictly with developmental, you know, early life developmental issues. Now, neurology and dermatology are residencies that don't require an internal medicine residency first. So you can go directly from medical school to a neurology residency or directly to a dermatology residency. So neurology is a treatment of the nervous system and dermatology is a treatment of the skin, right? And the skin is actually technically one of the, it is the largest organ in the human body. It is an organ uh, in that it performs particular functions. Now I have internal medicine down here at the bottom because even though it's a primary care specialty, um, internal medicine is sort of the gateway to a whole slew of other medicine subspecialties that require um, a fellowship. So one thing I want you to remember is neurology and dermatology don't require a fellowship. That's a straight into a residency. Whereas all the rest of these require first so first, all the rest of these internal medicine subspecialties require first medical school, then an internal medicine residency, and then you can do 
a fellowship. So if you want to become a cardiologist, for example, you have to do medical school, internal medicine, residency, become board certified in internal medicine, and then you can become, uh, go to your cardiology fellowship and become a cardiologist. And then there's even more subspecialization there. Endocrinology is um, study of the uh, endocrine system. So this is all your um, things like all your glands. Uh, so if you are uh, have trouble with um, various hormones and secretions such as uh, relate to growth. So if you have slow growth, uh, if you're having trouble uh, with stress, things like that, you'd likely see uh, an endocrinologist. Uh, they deal with, so for example, some of my family members, uh, their thyroid fails to work. So they have hy uh, hypothyroidism. It means their thyroid doesn't function at a high enough level. But thyroid is a governing um, part of the endocrine system. And when it fails, it causes a whole slew of other problems. Gastroenterology is a study of the digestive system. So it's uh, uh, it, it, if you have issues with your stomach, issues with your bowels, uh, at some point, if you're lucky enough to make it to 50, you'll get a chance to go get your first colonoscopy, which I had the privilege of getting a couple of years ago, and I'll be getting one again in the next couple of years. So good times there. Hematology is the stud study of blood. Infectious disease is the study of things like COVID-19, right? So that's, uh, and HIV. So diseases that are transmitted in human society. Nephrology is the study of the kidneys. Uh, oncology is the study of cancer. Pulmonary is the study of the lungs, and there's more. So uh, you don't need to know all these, but you should generally be familiar with them. And the main point I want to make here is if you're seeing any of these sub subspecialists, they do medical school first, internal medicine residency second, and then they do a fellowship. And then there are all of these have subspecialties as well, further subspecialties. Now, going back from the medical side to the surgical side, we have a whole slew of surgical residencies, some of which uh, you uh, go directly to a particular kind of surgery. And again, some of which you'll do a surgery, a, a, a particular a, a residency first, and then a fellowship. So general surgery is going to work with the bowels. So uh, the, it's not the bowels, uh, the stomach and um, uh, uh About well, bowel is included, but generally the abdominal area is what I was trying to say rather than the bowel. So that would include everything down to the bowel, large intestine, small intestine, etc., but also the stomach, the esophagus, liver, gallbladder, and so forth. So it's all the soft tissue you know, in your abdomen. Orthopedic surgery is bones, right? And then within orthopedic surgery, we have subspecialties of, such as spine, hand, hip, etc., where someone likely would do an orthopedic surgeon surgery residency first, then do say a spine fellowship or a hand fellowship where they get additional training specializing in a particular bone system. Uh, urology is the study of uh, the urinary system. So this is going to deal with um, reproductive organs as well as it has connections, of course, to the kidneys, uh, uh, bladder, and so forth. Plastic surgery is dealing with primarily with the skin, um, and we think we tend to think of plastic surgery. We tend to think of of cosmetic surgery, but cosmetic surgery is really a sub section of plastics. So, plastics, a lot of plastics work with restorative surgery. So if you were in a car accident, uh, so for example, my um, uh, my daughter uh, was at one of those trampoline parks and she did a flip and landed such that her knee connected directly to her nose and it, uh, it, it twisted up her nose. She wound up having to have plastic surgery to restore that. 
Plastic, sur plastic sur surgeons work a lot with burn patients to restore the skin. So it's really surgery primarily around the skin, but it does a lot of plastics do uh, restorative stuff for people who have been harmed in some way. OBGYN, of course, is delivering babies and women's health related to uh, uh, the GYN system. Uh, ophthalmology is is surgical interventions on the eyes. So this is different from an um, from an optometrist. So an ophthalmologist is a physician and a surgeon. So they do surgical procedures such as cataract surgeries, uh, repairing your retina, things like that. Uh, as opposed to optometry, which where there is no direct intervention with the eye. Uh, and then neurosurgery, as opposed to neurology, neurosurgery is surgical interventions on the um, uh, uh, nervous system. So a neurosurgeon might uh, work on your, uh, work literally work on your brain, so brain surgeon, um, uh, work on your spine and so forth. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about psychiatry. So psychiatry is I have a great discussion about what psychiatry is with uh, Dr. Jeff Fetter. And uh, so if you're interested in the field of mental health and and in particular psychiatry, uh, Dr. Fetter is the chief medical officer at the New Hampshire State Hospital, which is the New Hampshire's state mental health facility. Uh, Psychiatry, as you hear Dr. Fetter talk about, is really the use of pharma pharmaceutical interventions to work on, on mental health disease. So it follows a medical model, right? It looks at the brain as an organ uh, and how it interacts with the body. Um, they do do some talk therapy, but again, it's primarily a biological model. Um, and it's not just the brain. There are other connections between the brain and other organ systems. So really fascinating. But it's important to remember, psychiatry is different than psychology. Psychiatry is a physician that ha follows a metal medical model to treat mental health. So their main tools that a psychiatrist uses is pharmaceutical interventions. A psychologist uses talk therapy or testing uh, to diagnose and treat, but does not, for the most part, use pharmaceutical interventions. Only a psychiatrist can do that because they are also a physician. So psychiatrist does four years of medical school and then does a psychiatry residency. There are also some psychiatry uh, fellowships. Uh, we won't get into those here, but you could further subspecialize into child psych and things like that. All right, so let's talk about this weird category of, ho of hospital-based physicians. So emergency medicine is a relatively recent specialty, and an and emergency medicine physician specializes in working in an emergency department. And emergency departments are, for the most part, only in hospitals. Now, there are some standalone emergency medicine uh, facilities, but they are all connected to a hospital and within a reasonable drive of a hospital. So their specialty is 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 saving life, limb, eyesight, rapid diagnosis. You should only be going to a emergency, uh, excuse me, an emergency room if you are in danger of life, limb, and eyesight. That's what an emergency is, and that's what your insurance company will tell you uh, if you show up and don't need emergency care. Radiology, we'll talk more about medical technology soon, but a radiologist uses various imaging tools such as X-ray, CT, MRI uh, to look inside your body. They also use uh, radiology technologies to do things like treat cancer. Uh, so they they are the ones who would radiate your cancer. Pathologists specialize in diagnostics, so they use advanced laboratory technology in a hospital to and they oversee all the testing. So if you ever had to pee in a cup or have blood drawn, all that stuff was going to a to and you were in a hospital, all of that was going to the lab. The lab is overseen by a pathologist, but also if you say had surgery and the surgeon 
removed something from uh, a potential tumor and they were trying to figure out what it was and whether it was cancerous or not, that, that biopsy or that sample would be sent to the pathologist who would then examine the tissue and make a determination about whether the tissue, the tumor was cancerous or not. So all of those really, all these specialties really exist primarily in a hospital or, uh, setting. And then anesthesiology, of course, is is the use of anesthesia. So it specializes in anesthesia um, and pain control, really critical for transforming surgery. We didn't have anesthesia until the late 1840s. We only had very primitive things like a bottle of whiskey. Uh, and that creates uh, other kinds of risk when you're going under surgical care. So a funny uh, personal connection, if you haven't noticed, my last name is Bonica. Uh, and I have have had some anesthesi anesthesiologists in my class, and they see my name, and they're like, "Oh my goodness, who uh, are you related to, Doctor John Bonica?" So, Doctor John Bonica, um, uh, so Doctor Bonica paid his way through college and medical school by being a professional wrestler. So here's a picture of him as a young man, as a professional wrestler. Uh, at various points, he was known as John the Bull Bonica and things like that. You know how the, I mean, you've guys seen the pro wrestling stuff, right? So in the, in his pro wrestling career, he was injured a number of times and as a result had chronic pain for most of his life. And so after he became a physician, he uh, chose to become an anesthesiologist and he studied pain management. And so uh, he is known basically as the founder of modern pain management, which is kind of cool. Uh, he's a like second cousin of mine from the same island off of uh, Sicily that my dad is from. Uh, so just a little fun fact there. So thinking about uh, different specialties, just to give you a flavor of, of how, you know, why physicians choose the paths they choose. So I've got the, some of the different specialties so you can see uh, how much they earn as well as how many years it takes post-medical school to complete the training. <clears throat> so for example, if you want to become a family medicine doctor, uh, it will take you three years post-medical school or seven years in total of medical training. And you'll earn about $250,000, not too shabby. Uh, you can become a internal medicine doctor uh, with the same amount of training. So you'll notice pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine, all the same amount of training. They make in the same ballpark, you know, and this is again, median. So this is the middle, about half make more, half make less. Hence, it's a median. Uh, a relatively new innovation in healthcare is the hospitalist. So this is an internal medicine doctor who be, who decides, I don't really want to do an outpatient practice. I don't want to have a panel of patients that consider me their doctor. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work for a hospital. And whenever a patient is admitted to the hospital, I will become their primary doctor and I will oversee the medical care that they're getting in the hospital. Now, this is typically on the medical side, unless they're admitted for something specific like cardiology. So you can see hospitalists tend to make about 307,000, which is quite a bit more than their outpatient oriented colleagues. And this is because hospital, when, when you're dealing in the hospital, you're tending to generate some really big bills. And so hospitalists get to participate in that larger income stream. Now we get into some of the big money, go down here and you can see cardiology, your basic cardiologist who does the four years of medical school, right? Um, uh, that should probably be, that should be seven years. Uh, sorry, not, uh, no, six years post, right? So uh, three years of, uh, excuse me, three years uh, four years of medical school over here. All right, I'm going to get this straight. All right, sorry about that. I got a little uh, distracted by my computer, my screen's shutting down on me. All right, so let me see if I can get this right. So cardiologist, 
does four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, and then three years of cardiology. So a total of six post-medical school or a total of 10. They earn an average of, excuse me, a median of 529,000. Not bad. Uh, GI docs, similar amount of training. Uh, I think that's actually on the low end for GI and this is a couple of years, this data is a couple of years old. Uh, if you go down to the surgical specialties, you can see a, uh, orthopedic surgery, orthopedic surgeons do very well, median, median income of 619,000. But if you specialize in spine, uh, 835. So one of the things we're going to talk about here in, uh, toward the end is the maldistribution of physicians, first and foremost, between the different specialties. So why do you think somebody decides, you know what, you know what, I I, uh, I think I'm going to not be a family medicine doctor. And instead, I think I'm going to become an orthopedic surgeon, or better yet, a spine surgeon. Well, yes, they have to do two or three more years of training, but they make three times as much income for the rest of their life after that. So, and then if you go down to dermatology, for example... Dermatology, you only have to do your residency four years after your medical school. So a total of eight years of training versus seven years of training. And you make, you know, if you're comparing yourself to say a, a family medicine doc, you're going to make $220,000 a year more for the rest of your professional career. So why do you think people wind up choosing to be specialists rather than primary care? Well, a big factor is money, right? Quite bluntly, a big factor is money. Specialty specialists make a lot more money than our primary care providers, but our society needs more, uh, excuse me, more primary care doctors than they do specialists. So we, and the thing is that the government sets most of the reimbursement policies, basically sets what the income will be based on the specialty. And then we turn around as a society and complain that people don't want to be primary care doctors. They only want to be specialists. So we'll talk more about that down the road, but I just want you to kind of be aware that economics, right, is a real factor here. All right. So let's leave physicians and talk about what we're, what we now call mid-level providers early in my career were called physician extenders, but that's not said in polite society anymore. So we had the two big ones are physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Um, physician assistants and nurse practitioners are similar. Uh, the main difference is a physician assistant used to be uh, used to be a two-year uh, degree, went up to a four-year degree, and is now a six-year degree. Um they were trained to work with a physician, hence physician assistant. So they work under the license of a physician. So most of them started out as primary care assistants. The idea was that they could provide, they would be a cheaper way of providing basic primary care and anything more complicated that complicated that they couldn't handle. They would refer to a physician, family medicine doctor or a, phys a, a internal medicine doctor. Nurse practitioners come from a slight, so they have a very much a medical model. Nurse practitioners grow out of the nursing field. So in order to become a nurse practitioner, you have to do a four-year RN first, and then you do a master's level, two more years uh, training to become a nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioners and PAs are very similar in terms of what they can and can't do. They're not doctors, but they can do much of what doctors can do. Now, more recently, PAs and nurse practitioners um, have moved into a whole range of other subspecialties. So for example, I had a small growth on my back, a small tumor on my back. Uh, it was a sub you know, right below the skin, just looked like a little bump about the size of, uh, by the time I had it excised about the size of a quarter, uh, that was actually taken out in the clinic. So generally, excuse me, local anesthesia. So just gave me a couple of shots in my back and then they cut my back open, scooped out the uh, tumor. And that was done by a nurse practitioner. So nurse practitioners are now doing general surgery 
uh, are becoming general surgery specialists. So they support general surgeons. But they also do one of the more common ones is a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So this is a often a psychiatric nurse who then goes on to get her nurse practitioner, his or her nurse, nurse practitioner degree, so that they can administer psychiatric medication. Um, some other flavors include, uh, in particular, of the from the nurse side, include nurse midwives. So a nurse midwife is a woman uh, or man that is trained. Uh, as a nurse first, and then does follow on training. So an additional two years, learning how to uh, care for pregnant women, and then manage the birth. Very popular with some people because it has less of a clinical feel and more of a holistic feel to it. Certified registered nurse anesthetist or CRNA. It is likely if you get surgery that uh, unless it's a very complicated case, it's likely that you will get a CRNA to deliver your anesthesia. Uh, I've had, uh, my wife has had a CRNA uh, do her epidural when she was delivering our second child. I've had a CRNA do my anesthesia when I had my colonoscopy. So they're great. Uh, they are, again, it's a four-year RN followed by two years or three years now, depending on the program of anesthesia training. And there are others, but that's a good good uh, uh, introduction. This photo is of, of a friend of mine, uh, uh, Karen Clements. She used to be the chief nurse at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital and now is the chief nurse at Mercy Hospital in Portland. And uh, She's sort of on a retirement pathway because she moved to Portland because that's where her grandbabies are and that's where she wanted to be. But she's a fabulous person. Uh, and she is, you know, she was an RN uh, with an MBA. So she, so nurses, uh, we have, we have multiple kinds of nurses. Historically, they were, uh, well, we'll talk more about the history of nursing in a later chapter, but you can today in today's medical system, you will run into two or three year RNs, which are meaning they have had two years or three years of training and then taken a, a nursing exam to get their RN um, uh, license, uh, you will also see bachelor's level or BSN, so Bachelor of Science in Nursing. That's the level that we train to here at UNH. Um, but being a registered nurse doesn't rely on the number of years specifically. So you can become an RN with only two or three years of training or up to four years of training. Um, all nurse mid-levels, so the, what we were just talking about a minute ago, so the midwife, the CRNA, the nurse practitioner have to earn their BSN and RN first, then they can go to advanced uh, graduate training, should be graduate, not graduated training, advanced graduate training. Um, you'll also see in a, in a hospital, nursing home, or a clinical setting, you'll also see non-RN nursing staff, such as a licensed practical or vocational nurse, LPN or LVN. These are people who've had typically somewhere around uh, two years of training, and they will they are able to do, they have a higher level of clinical practice, but not to the same level as an RN. So they can typically administer medication, for example. CNA or LNA, so certified nursing aid or licensed nursing aid, in New, New Hampshire is one of a handful of states in the country that require licensure to be a LNA uh, versus simply getting a certification to be an, uh, a CNA. So that that's the difference. It's a full license versus a certification. Uh, with a license, you have to apply to the state to get your license, whereas a CNA, you take a test and you're done. With a LNA, there is a, LNAs are in, in the state of New Hampshire, LNAs are managed by the state board of nursing. So if someone complaint can, if you were an LNA, someone could file a complaint about you with the board of nursing, they would do an investigation and then they could take away your license. Uh, that's the main difference no license to take away with a CNA. Uh, the CNA just simply means you completed the training. It doesn't mean that you are a professional. Uh, so let's talk about pharmacists. All of us have used drugs at some point, hopefully legal. Uh, most likely you went to a pharmacy. Pharmacy Pharmacists 
function in hospitals, in uh, clinical settings, uh, outside of the hospital, as well as, of course, in retail. So, you know, we probably most often think of your retail pharmacist at, say, a CVS or maybe at your grocery store. But all hospitals have pharmacies because, uh, and they have both inpatient and outpatient pharmacies. We'll get into that a little more later. But so higher levels of care. Pharmacists are specialists in understanding the use of pharmaceuticals in a therapeutic environment. Pharmacists will often know more, uh, generally speaking, know more about drugs and the way drugs work and importantly, how drugs interact than your physician does, right? So this is all they do is drugs. <laughs> um, all they do is drugs. So they're always doing drugs, whereas your physicians are doing a variety of things. Now, physicians know a lot about drugs, right? Because they need to, but a pharmacist can be a really great ally to a doctor to because this is their this is their specialty. Um, now, to become a pharmacist, you have to go through a six year program and be, you become a doctor of pharmacy or PharmD. That doesn't mean you you're a doctor in the same way as a physician is a doctor. You are a doctor of pharmacy, so you'll see a lot of these doctor of term terms in healthcare. It just means that you have an advanced degree. So when I was coming up um, in the first eh, 10 years of my career, so from the 90s, the early 90s to the early 2000s, it was pretty standard that the pharmacists I worked with had four-year degrees. Now today, that, that has been extended to a six-year program. Um, so like other specialties, pharmacists can subspecialize. Uh, I had had friends who were oncology pharmacies, so they specialized in in working with patients with cancer, and so they were the ones who would actually like make the chemotherapy, for example, because a lot of these things have to be custom made. So if if you were going to a hospital to get chemotherapy, you would go to the oncology pharmacy, and an oncology pharmacist would probably prepare the specific dosages that your oncologist was recommending, and would partner with your oncologist to come up with the right uh, regimen of treatment. Nuclear medicine pharmacy is similar to that. So this is um, if you're going to do a study where they inject um, uh, uh, radioactive material into your body. The nuclear pharmacist is the one who, or the nuclear medicine pharmacist is the one who prepares the concoction that gets in, injected into your blood. So there's a bunch of different other specialties as well, but just to get a sense in the hospital, in the clinical system, there are, you know, it's not just your CVS pharmacist who's handing you bottles of pills. They're, they also do really some really complicated things. They're more like chemists. Um, you can think of them more like chemists. So dentists, of course, hopefully you've all been to the dentist. Dentists typically have, get either the DDM or the DDS, so doctor of dental medicine or doctor of dental science. As far as I know, there's no difference, and I'm not really sh even sure historically what the difference is between those. Uh, but basically, you're going to be one or the other four-year degree. The first two years of, of dental medicine is almost identical to the first two years of medical school. And then they, and then instead of doing clinical rotations through all the different kinds of medicine, they go into doing, you know, dental care. You'll typically have, get a, have a general dentistry uh, degree. So, so your, your dentist, unlike your physician, your dentist can do four years and move and be out and start practicing. Your physician today has to do, um, at, at least a residency. And so that's typically at least three years. So, so to become a physician is a seven-year process after bachelor's degree. To become a, a general dentist is only a four-year process. Now they can do further specialization. So if you've ever had your wisdom teeth yanked, that would have been an oral surgeon. So you would have to do further training for that. If you had braces, you'd go to get to an orthodontist. Um, if you're having trouble with your gums, so as you get older, if you don't floss, you should definitely floss. But if you don't floss, your gums will start to recede, and then you can you have um, you may wind up having to have surgery to restore your gums. So definitely floss. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, a lot of a lot of things, and then prosthodontics. So uh, if you lose your teeth and need false teeth, your prosthodontist is the person that makes false teeth. All of these 
specialties require that you do the general dentistry training first, and then you do this as additional training. Um, so you've probably been to one of these before you've, you know, if you were ever injured in sports, you might've gotten sent to a physical therapist. If you had a serious injury, uh, with your hands, you young people might've gotten, you know, that would probably be the only reason to go to occupational therapy. Occupational therapy does a lot of work with people who have had strokes and things like that as well. Uh, uh, the way I think of it is physical therapy kind of works with the gross motor movement. So it's restoring your ability to walk, to move and so forth. Occupational therapy focuses on functionality. So <clears throat> if you were in an accident and had your hand, uh, maybe lost one of your arms, you might go to an occupational therapist to learn how to use your prosthetic uh, and then learn how to, you know, cook um, or clean or do your job now in a different way. So occupational therapists help people solve problems uh, when they have some new limitation. One of the cool things you'll see if you're ever in Hewitt is there is an occupational therapy lab that includes things like a full kitchen where they practice teaching people with disabilities how to use uh, use a kitchen. In a similar vein, recreational therapy. This is something that I knew nothing about because it. Uh, I worked in the Army. I worked in the acute care side. And recreational therapy is really um, a post-acute uh, rehabilitation-based <laughs> specialty. But it's a really cool one. And we have rec therapy here at UNH. Uh, not in, in my college, not in my department. And what they do is they take recreational activities and turn them into uh, really kind of occupational therapy. So these two are very similar. So for example, uh, you were in a car accident and uh, injured your spine, and maybe you're now a, a paraplegic. You can't use your uh, legs. You can't, you're now confined to a wheelchair. Well, after, uh, while you were in, in, the, in the rehabilitation, a recreational therapist may come to see you and you know, help you and say, what did you, in order to help you, they would say, what did you like to do before you were injured, before your injury? And you might say something like, well, I used to really like to ride my bike. And they say, well, that's great. So what we have is a hand cycle. So this is a bicycle with uh, the hand grips are, allow you to pedal. So you can pedal the bicycle using your hands instead of your feet. And that's great, right? Of course, because now you're learning a skill that you want to do because, you know, you want to be able to go back out and ride your bicycle. But the therapeutic portion of this is in order for you to use the hand cycle, you have to learn how to make a transfer from your wheelchair to the hand cycle. And that is a new skill that you need to learn as a person who now is confined to a wheelchair. So it's making a transfer. And where else are you going to need to make a transfer? Well, you're going to need to make a transfer from your wheelchair to your bed, for example, to go to bed at night. You're going to need to be able to make your a transfer from your wheelchair to a toilet. Uh, you're going to need to make a transfer from your wheelchair to a dinner chair or some, whatever else, right? So a new skill that you need as a person who is recently confined to a wheelchair is this ability to make transfers. So what recreational therapists try to do is they look for a thing that you want to do such that you have an internal motivation to want to do it. And then they turn that into a therapeutic intervention. So again, like teaching someone who's recently confined to a wheelchair, teaching them, uh, uh, giving them the ability to ride a hand cycle, which then teaches them how to do a transfer. Many of you probably have had therapy at some point, And one of the most common therapists that exist in the United States are licensed clinical social workers. So these are social workers that have a master's degree in uh, uh, therapy. Um, so this is very common. Less common and requiring more training is a clinical psychologist. So whereas a clinical social worker is a six-year degree, uh, four years plus two years of, of therapy, clinical psychologist is uh, four to seven years of training. And clinical psychologists do do some 
therapy type work, but a lot of them do specialize in testing. So they do high levels of testing. So for example, to, to determine the level of autism that a, that a person might have or some other, uh, some other learning disability. So you'll see clinical psychologists working in school systems, for example, that they do, uh, testing. So if you ever had an, um, uh, what is that called? I, I want to say an IED, but that's an, uh, that's an explosive device, a, uh, um, independent learning. I uh, can't remember it right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, a, a program where you had special, special needs addressed by the school, um, that would have been determined by your, at least in part by your clinical psychologist. All right. So in that, that's kind of the broad field of allied health. Those were the licensed P these are all people with licenses. So they have to get a license, uh, at the end of their training, but we have a lot of allied health people that don't have licenses. So we have a lot of different technicians and technologists that don't have licenses, such as a lab technologist that runs complex tests. Uh, so you, you, we have that program here at UNH occupational therapy technicians, physical therapy technicians. These are people that have a couple of years of training and work under the license of a occupational therapist or a physical therapist, radiology technician. So if you ever had an x-ray done, it was probably done by a rad tech, not by a radiologist. You probably never met the radiologist. So rad techs, uh, uh, that's what we call them in the, in the, in the business, uh, do all, you know, run all the different, um, uh, imaging tools such as x-ray, MRI, and so forth, and ultrasound and so forth, right? So there's a lot of these different kinds of technicians. These pay really well and typically don't have, you know, somewhere, they have somewhere between a year and two years on average of training and good, good, good income associated with them. Here's one of the interesting things I, um, that I only recently found out. I was having a conversation while I was at my dentist with my dental hygienist, and she informed me that dental hygienists can work independently in Maine. So that means dental hygienists have to be licensed uh, in all, all 50 states, as far as I know. In most states, a dental hygienist has to work under the license of a dentist. So they can't hang out a shingle and start advertising that they can do cleanings. But this is the person that typically does like your cleaning for you. In Maine, in order to address the shortage of dentists in Maine, Maine al now allows dental hygienists to practice on their own. They don't have to work under a dentist. And so they get to keep uh, more of their income, which is pretty cool. Uh, and and an appropriate response, in my opinion, to a short shortage of dentists. Now, near and dear to my heart, of course, are administrators because that was my uh, role. Now, administrators provide non-clinical support to the system. So this is administrators, you know, the way I think of it is, you think of the Patriots, right? Well, the players on the field, they're gonna be your physicians. They're the one that everybody's focused on. But, you know, how does Gillette operate? Think about that. Who's selling the tickets? Who's making sure that uh, the hot dog stand is open and the concession, all the other concessions and the merchandise that you just have to have uh, is all operating? Well, that's going to be kind of the equivalent of your administrators. And it's a great field, right? It's a great field. There's a lot of en low level, entry level stuff that doesn't require much education, such as uh, ambulatory or patient. Uh, service rep, we call them PSRs or ASRs. These are the people that run the front desk. They do more than answer the phone. They make sure that you're, you know, you have your ske scheduling and all these things are happening so that the doctor has all the patients that that he or she can see. Revenue cycle analyst is somebody that may, you know, billing in healthcare is incredibly complicated. Um, and so the revenue cycle analyst is somebody that works to make sure that the doctor and the and the hospital get all the revenue that they're supposed to get when they do the work. Um, information systems analyst, right? So everything in, in healthcare is heavily IT now. One of the few licenses, in fact, the really the only license that I'm aware of, license meaning as opposed to certifications, the only license that I'm aware of on the administrative side is the nursing home administrator. So in 
every state, as far as I'm aware, in order to, to run a nursing home, you have to have a licensed nursing home administrator, LNHA. So I'm on the board of licensure for nursing home administrators in the state of New Hampshire. And you have to do, in addition to having an appropriate, you don't have to have a particular degree to be a nursing home administrator, but you have to have enough credits to show that you've earned, you've learned about running a health, you have an understanding of healthcare. So you have to take courses like this one that you're in right now. Then in New Hampshire, you have to do a year long, what's called an administrator and training program. So it's a, or we call it an AIT, um, where you work under the supervision of a, of a, a, a of an experienced licensed nursing home administrator. Um, and they teach you the ropes and it's for a year. And then you'd have to take a, a national exam and a state exam in order to do it. So it's pretty serious stuff. And it's pretty serious stuff because you have incredible uh, responsibility. And this is a great field uh, for young people. And uh, I typically send a couple of my students each year out to AITs after they graduate and they do very well for themselves. And I'm happy to answer questions about that if you're interested. Administrators can move into all kinds of different functions, operations, generally the, the running of a, of a hospital or running of a clinic, finance, which is what I did, you know, everything from getting the revenue that's supposed to come in to creating budgets and, and managing resources, IT, of course, human resources. I mean, the world is your oyster in healthcare, and most of them are not licensed. So whatever you're getting your degree in, you could potentially go on to get a job at a hospital working in some sort of administrative role. And this course would help you a lot with that because you'd have some of the terminology and you'd know some of the people who you're working with, such as, you know, the difference between a... Um, a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. So what do we see for trends in healthcare? We're almost done. What do we see in, in trends in healthcare? Well, I, I mentioned earlier, we have a problem with too many specialists and not enough general practice or, or primary care uh, providers. Again, that goes to, in particular, re, uh, our compensation, right? If you're going to go do a you know seven or eight years of training and you're now choosing between a specialty that's going to pay you two hundred fifty thousand versus five hundred thousand, you're probably going to think pretty long and hard before you decide to take the lower paying one. We also see a shortage of physician uh, physicians in rural areas. Again, compensation doesn't go up. In fact, it goes down for most physicians if they move out to rural areas. And if you've got to spend ten years getting training. That's a lot of, of income that you've given up and you've probably taken on a huge amount of debt. And so you're not going to go to a rural area where you're going to get less pay. Um, there are shortages of other kinds of staffing out in the rural areas as well, all the way down from physicians, all the way down to technicians. It's hard to re retain um, people in the rural area. And that's a problem in, in states like New Hampshire, where we're about... Uh, we're about half to two thirds uh, rural. And then physician burnout. We're seeing a lot of challenges with physicians just getting exhausted um, and regretting their choices. Um, supply of, of medical professionals. So we said geographic maldistribution, right? So that's too many, too many physicians and other kinds of providers in the cities, not enough in the country and, or in the rural areas. Specialty maldistribution, largely because of compensation being distorted by government decisions about what different procedures will be paid and what what different kinds of practices will be paid. Uh, and so you know, this kind of gets into the last sections of prices and allocation of resources, right? The government is setting the government setting of prices and setting of allowing the market to to decide uh, really does create all mostly creates these the problems that we're dealing with. Um, so we create our own problem. Um, I'll just leave that there. Some other trends in, in, and we'll end on this, some other trends in healthcare staffing, right? Um, healthcare delivery organizations, especially hospitals, are 50% or more, uh, really, their budget is spent on on people. So if you look at the budget of a hospital, it's typically they're spending more than half of their expenses on paying salaries and wages higher and high we're requiring higher and higher levels of training so maybe down here rising educational requirements right so that i talked about in my career 
you know, from the early, the early nineties through to the early two thousands, we went from requiring a pharmacist to have a four-year degree to a six-year degree. That's two more years of, of not earning a salary and two more years of student loans, right? So that's a lot of money. Physical therapy has gone from four to seven years of, you know, six or seven years of training. Nurses, uh, the system is squeezing out two and three, three year RNs uh, in favor of four year RNs. You know, it, it, what that does is, is a lot of people who might be, who might say, you know, I'd like to be a nurse um, and I'd be willing to do two years of training, but four years is too much. We wind up losing those people to a different field. They did, often don't just say, all right, well, I guess I'll just do four years. What they say instead is, you know what, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to be a rad tech instead, because that's a two year, to, that's a two year program, not a four year program. So that's a, that's, that's a problem. And another reason why we see shortages and then other increasing regulatory and educational requirements, such as more extensive licensing requirements result in increased cost, both for the individual trying to earn the the degree or the license. And then once those people have been trained, institutions have to pay them more because it costs them you know, more effort to get there. All right. So that's a quick overview of um, healthcare professions in the United States. And we will talk more about technology soon.